So I am going to spend um, a good amount of time giving kind of the, the whirlwind tour of reads. If you've been using reads, um, is, everybody see my, is this the correct screen on here? So we can frame. Okay, yeah. So if you've been using reads for a while, or if you've been in one of these meetings before, a lot of this is probably going to be review. Um, but there are, is some new content to kind of touch on some of the newer features that other folks will go into more depth um, later in later today, um, and you know, and discussions that we want to have after that. So I'll start with just a really high level overview. Um, before digging into some of the specific features, characteristics, and unique capabilities of reads. So, you know, the general idea of reads is it's a tool to do kind of what if scenario analysis for the US electricity system um, and other, other um, you know, countries will hear about reads India as well. But the, the model generally is used to look out, you know, several decades into the future to understand what types of investment decisions for generation, storage, transmission, carbon mitigation are you know, least cost um, optimal for various different situ uh, scenarios. So the model is taking you know, inputs related to the various types of technologies that can contribute to providing grid services. Um, and it it also accounts for you know a large range of electricity system constraints and and realistic limitations in the system, and so it's also taking account for things like you know policies and regulations, obviously demand for electricity, um, but also requirements for you know reserve capacity and ancillary services, and then there's also you know transmission constraints, um, constraints related to the power systems themselves, resource limitations. Um, and so on. And so it's, it's intended to be, you know, really, you know, applied approach to looking at this planning problem for, for a realistic electricity system. So there's several key, I'm going to go over several kind of key inputs and outputs to the model to get a sense of, you know, what goes in, what goes out. Um, we all have heard the, or many of us probably have heard the modeling term, you know, garbage in, garbage out. We hope that we are not putting garbage in so that we get useful information out. Um, and so one of the, the key things that we have to start with is obviously the, the fleet and the existing capacity, um, both for generation and the transmission overlay. And so this is a pretty complex looking figure, but it's showing that you know we actually are getting, are able to use a unit level database in this model, um, accounting for all the different resources, different technologies, um, throughout the country. And then the black lines and the widths of those lines, uh, sorry, there's no, there's no key on here for that, uh, but that's representing the transmission overlay that connects different balancing areas and reads. And I'll go a little bit more into that kind of spatial resolution later. Um, so obviously the grid requirements are one of the main inputs to the model. And so that, you know, again, includes electricity demand for which you can have very di various different scenarios. Um, and that's, you know, looked at at an at a aggregate level in terms of how it changes over the course of, you know, many years. Um, but then we also have, you know, chronological profiles for electricity demand. Um, here's showing some, you know, hourly data, which is what we start with before potentially aggregating to a more aggregate time slice resolution. And then, you know, another key input is obviously um, the cost and performance of the various technologies that are available to provide these, you know, various grid services. Um, and so that comes um, in a, you know, different, several different forms, depending on the technology, which shown here is the idea of, you know, we might just have one cost projection for nuclear, a couple different options for natural gas, um, you can see some of the split between you know, combustion turbine, combined cycle, CCS. Uh, but then for things like you know, batteries, we have several different durations that have different options for um, cost and performance projections. Uh, for things like wind and, and PV, we have various different classes of resource. And so um, there's a lot of technology resolution that goes beyond just kind of the broad category. Um, for temporal uh, uh, 
resource availability. Um, the model actually does start with hourly data for you know wind and PV. That's you know starts from a a gridded um, resource assessment data that you know Anthony will talk about um, a little bit later today, and that's you know in order to get obviously the heterogeneity of the resource across the United States, both in, in time and in space. Um, and so that's, this is showing, you know, kind of how different types of resources are distributed across the country. And that's one of the, you know, the key things that we use this model. Um, and, you know, these, a lot of these are NREL developed data sets um, that, you know, we, we have a lot of pride about. <laughs> um, another, you know, key characteristic here is obviously the definitions of um, policies, both what exists and what could exist. Um, and so this slide is just kind of giving the idea that, you know, we can look at things at the national level, um, you know, carbon limitations, renewable or clean energy requirements, but also state level things like, you know, the same types of policies at the state level, but also renewable portfolio standards. And, you know, our general MO is that, you know, in a given version of the model, it's representing all enacted policies up to that date. And then there's several different options for um, if you want to test, you know, kind of what if this was a plot um, enacted or or that. In terms of outputs, you know, the, the key high level thing that we generally start with when we're looking at the results is, you know, what is the mix um, over time, both on the generation side and the capacity side. And so, you know, we could look how things are being are being built, how they're being retired, and how that balance and mix changes, and, and how that, you know, how that correlates to the relationships between technologies in, in terms of how they might complement or compete with each other. And it's important to look at both capacity and generation, you know, obviously, because not all technologies generate, you know, near their maximum available output. And you have certain technologies, particularly storage, that you know have capacity but are really net users of energy, and so if we want to understand their deployment, you know we have to look at the the capacity basis for those things. And you know, in addition to that aggregate build out, you know we're able to look at the the investment decisions at a regional level, and so we can understand you know where these technologies are being built, not only you know at what time, um, and then we can look at transmission expansion as well. And so this is a little bit more detailed look, not kind of the straight line um, representation of our transmission system. And this is uh, demonstrating that, you know, more recently we've incorporated data that actually accounts for likely transmission paths between balancing areas. And so we have a better estimation of distances and thus the losses along those lines. Um, and we can do, you know, just a better analysis of transmission capacity expansion not only you know when it's built but what type of transmission is built ac dc and so on we also like to look at a lot of different economic outputs um, and so that can take a several different forms um, one of the things that you know we might start with is a net present value cost across you know all investment and operation costs throughout the entire time period and so this is a discounted cost calculation. So obviously the results depend on what you're using for a discount rate here, um, but it's a way to just get a, a quick breakdown of you know, how the economics are shaking out in terms of capital expenditures, fuel you know, for fossil fuel or, or nuclear fuel, um, other operation maintenance expenses, transmission, this is spur line transmission and so on. Um, and so you can kind of compare these aggregate costs across scenario to see sort of the, the long run economics in that way. Um, we also like to look at a lot of marginal cost metrics or, you know, which can be interpreted in some ways as, as sort of price metrics, although, you know, there's a lot of caveats there. We're not, you know, representing all of the market rules, for example, of different ISOs. And so the, the price formation in reads, it is based on kind of the, the shadow prices and the marginals off of the different constraints for things like demand and capacity. But, um, you know, there's no expectation that these prices are gonna, you know, match what's in real markets. The idea is that we can compare these types of 
marginal price and cost metrics across scenarios and see you know, what's higher, what's lower, what are the different components of each. And so we can break these prices down into things like the energy price for load or the capacity price for planning reserves. Um, we can also take these costs and look at them at a more raw level um, and break them down over time. And you, know, you could look at these annualized, discounted, undiscounted. Um, and then these costs um, and prices can more recently, we've created a module that does post-processing and actually is intended to estimate, you know, kind of the conversion between some of these more wholesale marginal um, cost metrics and think about, you know, what would be the additional cost for transmission, distribution, administration, and so on, in order to come up with an, an estimate of actual retail rates. And so this is fairly new. Um, but the, the point here is that, you know, obviously wholesale market prices are different than retail prices. And a lot of people care about a metric that is, you know, what will show up on my monthly bill. Uh, and so we developed this to, you know, just provide another option for an economic metric to look at. We also like to look at a lot of the impacts of the scenarios on the environmental side. And so, you know, obviously we're um, optimizing generation and dispatch in this model. And so we can look at the emissions implications of that. And, you know, more recently, and uh, I think you'll hear about more about this later, but uh, we also have a new module to actually convert some of these air emissions into monetary health impacts, you know, using some literature data on, you know, kind of mortality, morbidity, and things like that. So that's a real quick high level look at just some of the basic features and ideas involved in the reads model and so now i'm going to dive just kind of the next level deeper into you know what are some of the specific characteristics of the model and you know what i what i like to say like what makes reads special because there, there are a lot of these tools out here and we thank you for being here and choosing reads <laughs> so how does it really work so um, reads is an optimization problem. Um, if you're already very familiar with optimization problems, this is probably pretty straightforward. Um, but the idea is that you know you start with an objective. So what is you know the one quantity that you want to maximize or minimize? In our case, it's minimize the total capital and operating costs of the electricity system. And it does that subject to several different constraints on that system. Um, mentioned a lot of these already, you know, energy balance, capacity requirements for planning and operating reserves, policy requirements, um, you know, availability of renewable resources, limitations on, you know, how energy reserve or even things like renewable energy credits can get traded around, um, you know, how the physical constraints on the power systems themselves and fuel supply, and also things like, you know, what um, prescribed builds and retirements and, and so on. So there's a lot of different constraints. If any of you, whoever's looked at the code <laughs> knows this very well. Um, but the idea is, you know, you've got this overall objective, minimize the cost. You've got a lot of different constraints. We already talked about a lot of these inputs and those involve not only the data, but also the structures. Um, and so I'll talk about some of those structures a little bit later in more detail, but, you know, we have, for example, 134, zones for which we balance supply and demand. So that's kind of the spatial resolution for representing a lot of the characteristics. Um, and so all of these different things, you know, cost and performance, um, resource availability, the initial capacity mix go as an input. And then, you know, we talked about these outputs already where we get, you know, the capacity mix, transmission. Um, haven't talked a whole lot about operations, but we'll get to that a little bit more later where, you know, there is, a component of the optimization that involves a, a dispatch um, as well. And so we are actually optimizing the energy generation <clears throat> uh, versus something, you know, a little bit simpler, like assuming a capacity factor that people would do like in an LCOE. So it doesn't do that. We actually optimize the, the dispatch as well. And then we talked about emissions and, and cost metrics. <clears throat> so to break down what goes into the objective, you know, we have all of the different capital, fixed variable, O and M cost, fuel, um, you know, kind of opportunity costs for providing ancillary services, 
policy payments. So all of these things are, are being summed up. Um, the objective is formulated as a 20 year net present value. Um, and so what it's doing is it's minimizing the costs in a specific model year, um, but doing it with a 20 year economic life um, present value calculation. And so what that's kind of means is if you're running the model kind of one step at a time, one year at a time, it's looking at that model year as if it's sort of a, a static myopic representation of what the next 20 years would be like. So there are some limitations to that, but it, that's um, one of the ways in which we run the model and, and really the more typical way. And so the, the reason for that is that you can actually, you know, account for kind of a reasonable economic life. And that has also incorporates things like the financing of uh, new capital investment. And essentially in the model boils down to how you convert, how you would convert overnight capital costs to install capital costs by accounting for things like interest during construction, um, any kind of, you know, tax uh, rates and policies, debt equity ratios, and and we can, you know, have these some of these parameters be technology specific, um, and they can change over time. You know, like if there's a tax policy that's enacted that has some kind of sunset, we can account for that change in how that would influence financing over time. I mentioned this briefly on the last slide, um, but one of the, you know, things we really want to make sure. Um, everyone understands about the Reeds model is that it doesn't use LCOE at all. You know, it's actually um, optimizing the operation and LCOE number requires you to assume a capacity factor. Um, so you're assuming upfront how, what percentage of the year you're running. Um, but Reeds is actually doing that in the optimization. Um, and so we can calculate LCOE as an output, um, but it's not, you know, simply just looking and comparing LCOEs across technologies to make decisions. Um, and then it also, you know, another thing to be clear of is elect electricity prices or any kind of marginal price or cost metric. Um, these are also outputs, these are not inputs. And so this is not a price taker model in any form. Um, it's simply a least cost model subject to constraints and those constraints effectively define what the prices of the different um, you know, kind of services on the grid would be. Uh, so that's what the objective is, is doing. Uh, the way we typically run the model, and this is the only thing I'm going to really go over here, um, is the sequential solve mode. And so reads really consists of kind of two major model optimizations. One is the supply module, and that's the one that's making all of the investment decisions. And it has a simpler form of representing electricity dispatch, at least um, the way we normally run the model because of computational limitations. But because of those challenges um, and the, the limitations involved in simplifying time resolution to make investment decisions, we have this separate module called Augur that functions to calculate capacity value of variable renewables and storage, curtailment of variable renewables, and energy arbitrage value for storage. Um, and that's actually using, and I'll go into this next slide, seven years of hourly data. And so the, the balance there is that, that model has a lot higher, that, that part of the optimization has a lot higher time resolution, can do a better job characterizing these specific parameters that then inform the supply module and how it can make decisions around you know, those you know, variable renewable storage and all the other technologies in combination. And so it steps through in time in each of these supply module solves, you know, it's minimizing that same objective um, before getting, um, feeding, you know, the existing, the, the resulting system into this auger module that then calculates these parameters to inform the supply module. And, and the reason we do this is because, you know, these parameters depend on the electricity mix, the, you know, the demand profiles, net load, and that changes over time, changes what you build. Um, and so it's important to account for that, that transition. Uh, and we'll look a little bit more later on sort of what that actually looks like. So for the time resolution, 
so this is showing graphically what I've already talked a little bit about. So in the main investment, the supply module, um, we typically use this 17 time slice resolution. And so there's four time slices per season, plus this super peak to capture um, reserve requirements. And that, you know, at least allows us to capture seasonality of resources and um, chronological, you know, diurnal profiles of resources to some extent. Um, but obviously that's fairly coarse. Um, we have a lot of ongoing work um, where we're that, that Patrick is going to talk about later, where we're actually building capability to um, define any time resolution you want. Um, but there's a lot of computational challenges of adding time resolution, um, and so we're still kind of working on what that what that'll look like in kind of default solve mode going forward. Um, but that's why we have this auger module that's accounting for you know these hourly profiles, and it does a simplified dispatch across all of these hours. Uh, seven years worth to assess these parameters I mentioned before. Um, spatial resolution also has a lot of different forms. Um, so I'm just going to get all this on there. Uh, for renewables, we actually do have some capabilities where if you want, you can actually represent um, some site level renewable data. Um, again, you know, always a trade off between computational complexity and sort of, you know, accuracy. Um, but we also generally have uh, 356 resource regions for wind and CSP. This 134 zones or balancing areas is generally the resolution that we represent most technologies. But again, you know, there's like subcategories of technologies and things like that. I'll go into the next slide to get more resolution there. But this is where we're enforcing these constraints on things like um, electricity demand, planning reserves, operating reserves. And then kind of going up, we can aggregate from there. Um, and so there's um, these boundaries all follow county boundaries. And so they're easily aggregated to states, um, a little bit less easily aggregated to things like ISO regions, NERC census divisions. Um, but we have representations of those that are as close as we can get so that we can enforce constraints or define parameters at different levels of resolution in the model. On the technology side, uh, we have you know, quite a bit of technology differentiation in the reads in the model. I don't really think I'll go over, I'm not gonna like list everything here. Um, you know, these slides will be made available, but you know, we have various different types of the, the fossil technologies. Um, on that side, you know, we're working on with the new version, having even more options for things like different CCS capture rates, carbon capture storage, um, for those that are less familiar with that. Um, we've got some also work looking at flexible configurations of CCS. For renewables, you know, it's not like just in each region, there's like a cost for wind and a cost for solar. No, we have very diff various different subcategories and resource classes. Um, for you know all the different renewable resource types, and then um, I guess I don't know if this is classified correctly on the bullets, but you know we also are, um, now have hydrogen fuel combustion turbine technologies represented for storage, different battery durations, pumped hydro and compressed air energy. Uh, one of the newer additions is PV battery hybrids, um, and so that allows you to share some components and potentially have some cost savings there. Um, and then some other more recent stuff that um, Brian's going to talk about a little bit later is some of these more demand side technologies. Um, so we now have capabilities to actually um, invest in electrolyzers of steam methane reformers to produce hydrogen that's then used by these combustion turbines. Um, we also have uh, air capture, direct air capture technology in, in the model. And so these are things that are getting added to start to have better, you know, more options for representing deep decarbonization scenarios and, and true, you know, net zero carbon scenarios. We also have upgrades available. Um, so you can upgrade between technologies. And then um, one of the things that's near and dear to my heart, maybe not as many other people on the REITS team, um, but if you're interested in any energy water interactions, um, there are some switches there where you can actually further distinguish all these you know, fossil technologies and, and like CSP by its cooling technology and water source. 
And so you can track um, where the power system is getting its water, how much it's withdrawing, how much it's consuming. Um, and there's some, some options there as well. Even further than that, um, for, the, for the thermal fleet, the fossil and nuclear technologies, we also differentiate those by vintages. Um, and this is actually user input. Um, by default, I honestly can't remember the number of bin vintages we have for each technology, um, but you can specify how many you want to represent, um, particularly for the existing fleet, all the way up to a unit specific representation of the existing fleet. And so this doesn't necessarily preserve all of the unit specific characteristics, but if you want, you can create enough vintages in a reason, region such that like every coal plant um, has its own vintage in that region and you can track that. Um, and then over time, you can define, you know, vintages for new builds. Like I want, you know, 2020 through 25 to be vintage new two, I want 25 through 30 to be new three and, and so on like that. And so you have a lot of ability to track and even influence what happens to individual vintages if that's something that you wanna, that you care about. Um, in terms of the, the capital stock more generally, so I talked about um, before we have, you know, a unit level database primarily based on EIA data um, from NEMS model that defines our kind of initialized fleet that still the initialized years is, is 2010. Um, but then it also has prescribed retirements and prescribed builds, you know, up until now and, you know, the near future of what we, and what, what's already been announced. In addition to these prescribed retirements, you know, there are also some options where you can do some scenarios around, you know, shortening, extending um, coal lifetimes, you know, different assumptions around nuclear relicensing and, and lifetimes. And, you know, you can always go into the unit database and play around with the numbers and, you know, have that show up in the model if you want to look at different scenarios for um, when things might retire. But in addition to that, the model does also endogenously retire if you don't recover a certain fraction of FOM costs. And so this fraction um, is, can also be user defined, you know, and it's just a factor that's there to add a little bit more flexibility in how you might wanna think about how retirement decisions are actually made in the real world. Uh, I see there's a couple of chat questions or chat messages. Um, if somebody wants to cut me off to answer those in real time, let me know, but I'm not monitoring those as I go. <laughs> um, I think we're good there, Stuart. So okay. Yeah. Um, so on the fuel price side, um, I'll kind of start from the bottom because that's simpler. So right now we're just using exogenous assumptions for coal and uranium prices. These come from the EIA annual energy outlook. Um, but for natural gas, since it's its usage and price formation is more tied to the electric sector, um, we have a lot more options there. And so we have different scenarios around um, resource availability that give you effectively like high, mid and low price natural gas. But we also have different um, approaches to representing formation of natural gas prices. And so REED actually you know, generally uses a supply curve representation. And the way that works is uh, if you choose an AEO, say the AEO reference natural gas case and reads over time uses exactly the same amount of natural gas as in the EIA AEO reference case, then the prices will be the same as the EIA AEO reference case. But you know, reads a different model, it's probably gonna do different things. Um, and so, we actually use the price quantity pairs over time for this case to define, define a linear supply curve. And what that means is, you know, Freed uses less gas than that particular case, prices will be lower, she uses more gas, prices will be higher, and so on. Um, and then these linear supply curves, um, you know, we've, we've tested several different ways of parameterizing them, uh, really in levels of aggregation. 
And so, you know, these are some of the different options that are available. Um, I'm not gonna go into everything in, in a lot of detail, but essentially this last one, we have supply curves with um, kind of two different components to the linear supply curve. One is a slope on the national side, one is at the census division side, and that's what we use by default. Um, but you can look at these other approaches if you want, or you can actually have just fixed exogenous prices um, if that makes more sense for your analysis. And that, that could be the case, right? Like if you're running a scenario where um, you're forcing natural gas, gas prices to zero, these supply curves could do weird things when you get to like near zero fuel usage, right? So, so it might be important to think about some of these other options in that case. On the electricity demand side, again, you know, some of our base options are based on the annual energy outlook, um, but we also have several different electricity demand scenarios from NREL's electric, electrification futures study. And so that includes both the degree of electrification. Um, those scenarios involve assumptions around, uh, you know, how how quickly um, electrified transportation and building energy systems are adopted, and how fast the technology improves. Um, and so that essentially defines different magnitudes of electrified demand growth. Um, but there's also options for defining how much of that to electrified demand is assumed to be flexible. And so this flexible demand actually gets optimized within the reads dispatch. And so it's kind of a carved out portion of demand you can shift around. And so there's different scenarios for that. Um, they're largely derived on, you know, essentially how flexible you think that we can manage electrical vehicle, electric vehicle charging. Um, just other things to mention on the, the on the load side, you know, we're accounting for losses on the transmission system and in storage systems, you know, route trip efficiency losses. Um, and, you know, talked about the seven years of hourly load data and, um, you know, the demand side technologies have, have come up as well. And so, you know, if you if you build these things, their effect on electricity demand also get accounted for in the model. On the, on the reserve side, so first I'll talk about operating reserves. And so this is, you know, kind of the ancillary service products that we represent in the model. In, in the reads, there are three we represent separately, flexibility, spinning, and, and regulation that are defined by, you know, kind of how fast, uh, or so how long, how, how fast you need to be able to supply a certain amount of capacity, uh, as well as the, quantities of, of renewable energy and load. And so, for example, flexibility reserves are a function of you know, generation from wind and the capacity from PV. And all of these numbers come from a um, come from literature, a publication that uh, came out several years ago. Uh, and so, you know, for example, flexibility is only to, based on the renewables, spinning reserve requirements based on a percentage of load, regulations, a little bit of both. And then, in terms of what technologies can do, you know, we use technology specific ramp rates to define how much they could provide towards these different um, ancillary services. And then we also, um, the objective function has, you know, opportunity costs associated with providing uh, those reserves. And, you know, again, the, the way the constraints are set up are that you can only provide these operating reserves if you have free capacity that you're not using for energy. And so that's, you know, for, for meeting electricity demand. And so that's accounted for as well. We do also allow you to essentially use available transmission capacity to contribute to reserves. So that's like saying, you know, if a neighboring balancing area has excess capacity that could send through a line to you if, you know, if you absolutely needed it, that's accounted for as well. And same thing with storage, um, it, can, it can provide reserves, but you need to make sure that there's sufficient energy available. Uh, next, we have the planning reserves. And so this is actually a, you know, a relatively important constraint. Um, if you looked closely at sort of the example price, marginal price data that I showed previously, you would have noticed that 
this planning reserve requirement is the second biggest contribution kind of to kind of like the total marginal cost metric. And so this is, you know, the requirement for capacity to ensure resource adequacy, you know, essentially, you know, can you meet demand in the worst case, you know, peak net load uh, situation. And so that's based on the, uh, you know, the electricity demand plus an assumed reserve margin that comes from, you know, NERC, NERC data for a given region. And we're applying this to each, you know, specific balancing area and season. And in order to um, characterize this constraint, you know, you need to assume what each generation storage tr transmission technology um, can be credited for this kind of fern capacity or its capacity credit. So, you know, for things that are fully flexible and dispatchable, you know, like natural gas, that's going to be 100%. Um, but for variable renewables and storage, where, you know, you don't necessarily have enough resource available at a given time to provide the full energy uh, or full, full power output, um, rate of power output of the systems, you know, we have to do a calculation to assume what that capacity credit would be. And then again, we can use this sort of available transmission capacity um, as well. And so what that kind of looks like is, you know, you've got your peak demand, some reserve margin, you've got, you know, what, what the firm capacity is of these, you know, more flexible dispatchable technologies. And then, you know, you're adding onto that, what is the, you're, you know, you're looking at the, the variable capacity um, and the net load of these other systems and then doing a calculation for the capacity credit of you know wind solar and, and uh, energy storage and this is one of the things that, that auger module is doing with that seven years of hourly data just to really briefly get into a little bit more of what that looks like um, so it's essentially using you know it's it's taking it's starting with a low duration curve it's using the variable renewables at the time to come up with a net load duration curve. And then it's you know, using that to look at not only what the capacity value of what's already been built is, but also a marginal capacity value for the next quantity of variable renewables that would be built you know, potentially in the next solve year. And so since this is a nonlinear thing, that's one of the reasons why we do this process, and so that we can kind of dynamically update this marginal capacity value. Because, uh, you know, intuitively it changes over time, right? Like the solar you build today probably has nearly 100% capacity credit at today's peak net load. But 30 years from now, when the peak net load is in the evening because of how much solar exists, right? Then the next amount of solar that gets built can't really provide anymore. Um, capacity at peak net load. And so that's one of the things that, you know, you exactly see if you look at a high, high um, share of solar scenario, um, this is just a, you know, a simple an example um, where since this is done for each region, there's a distribution, um, but very clearly as you're building out more solar, that capacity credit or the marginal capacity credit drops off, and then eventually it's you know very very close to zero. And so that's that's what these types of calculations are, are intended to capture. And then on the the curtailment side, you know it's similarly using this. Uh, it's calculated the net load. Here's our classic duck curve, and using that to make an assumption for you know what effectively is your curtailment rate. Um, and the reason that um, we, another you know, reason we have this module that's doing an hourly dispatch is because it's also dispatching storage, right? So like you can use storage potentially to reduce curtailments. And so that module um, can account for that and then calculate curtailments, you know, also based on some of that, uh, you know, diurnal storage optimization. Um, and then ultimately, you know, what that looks like is that you can estimate, you know, the distribution of cur curtailment rates 
across regions and you know how that changes with the the shares of those technologies um, a little bit more on just a few other things and then i will um, be done with my slides and we can open it up for for some questions but a couple other things that i wanted to highlight you know just based on kind of what are the hot topics and things of interest today so obviously battery storage is um, there's a lot of talk about battery storage and what that can do, what that's going to do, how that's going to change the the grid and how it can fit in with variable renewables. You know, we are looking at other storage technologies as well. I'll present on pump hydro in a little bit, um, but just want to point out that all storage technologies, you know, can provide various different value streams. Mentioned all of these already, but just to kind of pull it all together, you know, it can perform energy arbitrage. It can reduce curtailment and provide reserves. And you know, we represent all these different storage durations. And the reason for that is because, you know, there's a it's it's kind of a balancing act in terms of uh, for, for storage deployment in terms of what you would want to build um, based on how the capacity value, energy value changes over time. Um, and it also depends, obviously, on the technology parameters as well. So the duration of that storage, cost and performance of that storage, and that includes the round trip efficiency. And so here, um, this is just you know example scenario that's pretty favorable towards construction, particularly of battery storage. Um, so it starts off, you know, you've got the existing pump hydro fleet um, that kind of just marches along. But you'll you can if you look closely, you can see how you know, it starts off building two hour storage, then it starts building four, and then six, and then eight, and then 10. So, you know, this is correlating to an increase in variable renewable shares of generation. And so we can really clearly see how, you know, the preferred battery duration or a mix of better, not battery or, you know, just storage duration in general actually changes over time depending on the grid mix. And, and that's because of the the relationship between all of these factors, and so that's something that that you know we've we've been work, improving Reed's ability to account for. Um, some other things that I just want to point out that, um, like I said, Brian is going to talk about a little bit later, are that we have a lot of new features to have a better look at decarbonization analysis. Um, so that includes. Um, for on the hydrogen side, so we have the, these, you know, hydrogen fuel turbines. Um, they can be built new, or they can be upgraded from existing combined cycle or, or uh, natural gas turbines. Um, and we can represent this in a couple ways. The simplest way is to have an exogenous hydrogen price. In that case, you're not accounting for, you know, investments in hydrogen producing technologies and how that might affect the hydrogen price. Um, but we do now have the ability to represent those production technologies endogenously. And so you could be building steam methane reforming or electrolysis alongside the generation technologies that use that hydrogen. And then, you know, effectively the fuel price for hydrogen is based on which of these um, producing technologies you're building. And, you know, certainly the cost assumptions for those technologies. Um, so that's like another thing you could do sensitivities around. On the carbon dioxide re removal side, um, mentioned before that you know we're we're expanding our representations of, of carbon capture technologies. Um, there's also now you know going to be a, a biomass CCS. You can have a carbon negative CCS technology that's tied to. I, I didn't mention this before, but we do have uh, biomass fuel supply curves, um, and so bio CCS would be tied to that. So you can't just build indefinitely. You do have a finite fuel resource. Um, at least, you know, that's assumed in the model. Um, and then, you know, you can have not only new builds, but upgrades to CCS from coal and gas. Um, we have a couple of different options on direct air capture um, for the cost and performance projections. Um, and so you can see how that, you know, could play a role. And then another, you know, feature that, that we're incorporating into the model is going to be an endogenous CO2 transport and storage network. Um, and so that, you know, allows you to kind of further constrain the build out of, of CCS systems, um, 
and you know account for not only you know the cost and performance of capturing the carbon at at fossil fuel facilities but also the limitations around you know where you would have to then uh, inject that carbon in an underground um, yeah, storage site and you know the transportation costs to do that and the region specific costs of of you know injection and maintaining that uh, co2 storage or sequestration um, last couple slides um, also just wanted to mention again you know there's a wide range of policy options that are available in the model like i said we we are always making sure that we're accounting for all of the existing policies, at least the, the best that we can. So that includes all the tax credit policies, you know, any state level clean energy policies or regional level, you know, carbon trading um, or state level in the case of SP100. You know, we can account for air emissions policies, capacity mandates of different technologies, uh, but there's also lots of options, you know, around playing with emissions caps, rate limits, tax, um, clean energy, renewable energy requirements. And this is all defined very generically so that you have a lot of options for um, you know, what types of um, policies you might wanna consider. And so just to kind of close off here, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we've got in the works that we're really pushing the boundaries of, of complexity and what we can do computationally. Um, and I, you know, I'm well aware that on the user side, that probably creates a, a lot of challenges. Um, but the, the goal here is to have a lot of flexibility in how we represent things like uh, temporal resolution, spatial resolution, um, transmission system options, um, generation options. And then, you know, that just gives a lot of options for the user to consider different types of systems and, and tailor the analysis for, for what they wanna look at and, and what they can do. Um, and so just some examples are, you know, we, are, we really wanna be able to run reads without Augur at, an, well, at least, I don't know, maybe not everybody, but without Augur at, but at an hourly res resolution, because then like you could have everything fully encompassed in the same model, uh, but that's hard to do. Um, we're working on spatial flexibility, uprain transmission in a couple different ways. Um, you know, mentioned some of the CO2 network stuff that's going on, but, you know, also potential for adding hydrogen transportation net network representation as well. Um, some, of, some of you all might be familiar with the NARIS study that included um, Mexico and Canada. Um, one of the challenges with that study is it used some proprietary data um, and now um, somewhat outdated data. So we've got some ongoing work to at least build the capability to where, you know, you could choose the options to run from North America or the US and Canada. Um, and it would run, there might be some data limitations, um, but we wanna have that be possible for, for the public model going forward. Um, and then also things like looking at different weather years to account for different load and renewable energy profiles. Um, so um, really high level summary, um, Breeze has a lot going on. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, the reason for that is because there's a lot of, you know, really unique things. You saw how big the, the team is of people that are working in this model. We're really trying to be at the cutting edge of representing emerging technologies in the electric sector, variable and renewable storage, everything else. Um, and so our goal is to you know, keep, keep expanding the capabilities so that we're as relevant as we can be to you know, the current grid planning questions. Um, so that is all I have. Hey, Stuart, one question for you from Chad. Can you talk a little bit about units and the, being able to provide electricity, operating reserve, planning reserve, can you do all of those, just one of those? How, how does that work with the with assigning different services to, to a single generator? So you have a certain amount of capacity for you know a given generation block or capacity block, right? So we're we're not necessarily representing individual units, but say you know there's 100 megawatts of gas in a region. Uh, you know, it can only 
provide reserves at all if it's got available capacity that's not being used for energy. So there's constraints in there that are essentially saying, you know, like energy provision plus flex reserves plus spin reserves plus regulation is less than the max capacity. So that's that's how that's constrained. So you can't kind of double dip in your capacity. Is that the does that answer the question, Wesley? Yeah, but then you also have planning reserves too, though, right? That does. Yeah, yeah. So the planning planning reserves is treated separately, um, and so planning reserves is not an operational constraint. Um, it you know it's in the name. It's a planning constraint. So it's um, it's not based on what you're doing at a given amount of time. It's based on you know what is your essentially available capacity at a given time. And so it's independent of the operating reserves and energy constraints. Thanks, Stuart. So any other questions, you're to drop in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask them. We've got a couple more minutes before we're gonna head to break. Yeah, see there's a bunch in here. I don't know if there's any you want me to look at specifically. You know, we've, I, I responded to all of them except the one you just answered. So I think we're in good shape there. If anybody wants to follow up on a question we answered in the chat, we're free to unmute or drop in a follow up in the chat. Okay, so we don't, you know, it won't make you sit here and wait, we'll go ahead um, you're, you're welcome to put stuff in the chat through the break. We'll, we'll respond to things there. Stuart, if you want to read this one, you can respond to here in just a second. Um, so we will break after Stuart answers this next question that just showed up, and then um, we'll come back on at 10, 15 Mountain Time and start our next round of presentations there. But um, Stuart, do you want to go ahead and answer this question? Yeah, well, I, I think I understand your question, and the answer is Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you've got one constraint that says, uh, you know, energy plus operating reserve across all three has to be less than the rated capacity. But then you have a whole nother constraint that is requiring that's requiring planning reserves that the provision of the contribution to planning reserves it's completely independent of the contribution to energy and operating reserves. So I think that is that, is that a clear answer to your question? Okay. And that's that's consistent with the way things operate in real life. So you know, people are operating yeah. capacity market. They're looking at their planning. That's separate from their operations. So those things are are treated independently. And we've done the same thing with the modeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the planning reserve idea is for long-term planning. It's not to be based on the, it's to keep a buffer of capacity for long-term purposes. And, you know, it's a, in REEDS, it's not like we're representing extreme events, right? But like the whole purpose is to like ensure that REEDS is investing enough capacity so that in the real world, it would be available for, you know, heat waves and frozen electricity grids and stuff like that. Um, so, that's what that planning reserve constraint is in, intended to do. Um, but yeah, we're not actually representing those events in reads. We do other work, you know, where we take a read solution, we downscale it, run it into our Plexos production cost models. Um, that runs at hourly resolution. You can play with lots of different, um, you know, extreme event scenarios there. And, and that's the kind of stuff that we do to sort of stress test our reads build outs. Our reads. Clean Air Act 111B D. So, so Sandra, I think your question about the Clean Air Act pieces that probably be an offline piece. There's you're getting pretty far in the weeds here. So um, I feel free to feel free to follow up, Sandra, and we're happy to chat there. Especially getting the right people involved in that one. Um, but let's go ahead and take a break here and we'll come back in 15 minutes and pick things back up for uh, for more deep dive into what's changing the 2022 model version. So thanks everybody.